Put on there. Yeah. Make that he's, he's a fan of fanny packs. Yes, I love them. Wow. <laughs> you were doing fan, so well. A fan. <laughs> to that point. My um, my points. I got some points deducted. I'm gonna make one <laughs> adjustment here. I did a tote bag cleaning yesterday. Everybody has a shelf or a pantry or something where just junk everything in there. Dude, does one really need 23 different tote bags of various sizes? With you know, charitable logos or whatever. So. I need a tote bag to carry the tote bags around. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's good to consol not as bad consolidate. As koozies. Koozies? Oh, you have like a lot of the. Welcome to the Pace to Be Clean podcast with Amanda May and Sean Williams. We are here giving inspirations on how living clean pays off in love, lifestyle, and looks. We are super excited because we have David from the Katie Weekly Trail, uh, a Berkeley grad, huge, huge level of success, like blows our mind when we were reading about all of the accomplishments he has. He has won over 100 awards in his industry. And correct me if I'm wrong, you took a company from losing $1.4 billion to making $1.1 billion in sales. Is that correct? Am I wrong? Yes. Yeah, I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> on, well, on, listen. On a few accounts. <laughs> uh, I, Tell I, me about I, it, because I, I saw those numbers I and I was like. I went to the University of California, Goldberg, uh, Golden Bears, uh, Berkeley. Uh, it's Katie Trail Weekly. We've got to get the name right. Oh, it's my. Let start, me start right? this all over. How did I say it? Katie, Katie Weekly, Weekly Trail. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. It's funny Let because me... whenever I tell people that I'm editor of Katie Trail Weekly, they go, oh, that's great. How, how often does it come out? Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> Weekly, pretty much. Um, yeah, I grew up in Oakland, uh, went through the public school system there was the first of the kids to go to college, so didn't have a whole lot of direction. Wanted to go to Stanford because we watched Stanford football growing up. Ended up uh, getting into Berkeley, which is, you know, no small feat. Uh, uh, struggled, big school, too big. If I knew what I knew now, uh, it would be go smaller. And if I knew what I know today, I'm not even sure it's that important. Uh, mm -hmm. Life's experiences are way more important and way totally more agree. applicable totally uh, than anything you're going to learn from a textbook mm -hmm. uh, or from a stuffy professor smoking a pipe with uh, uh, patches on his sleeve, <laughs> on his elbows. Right? Um, but uh, being able to grow up in, the, in a very urban environment, I think, was a tremendous lesson. Again, better than anything I, I could ever get in a class. Uh, we had a, an extremely uh, multicultural neighborhood, and that was great. Uh, we all had one common bond, and that was to look out for each other. And I, I fear that we're losing some of that now uh, with the uh, division that's going on in America. It's, uh, we were all one team back then. Now it's two sides against each other. And, very little compromise, so. But that's not what you asked. It is <laughs> I love, I am and gonna ask you though. It, I'm gonna move comes, this a little it, closer to you. When it comes to the, uh, uh, the what you referenced uh, about, about the brand, we were brought on as an agency. I had uh, come down to work into the advertising business. I wanted to go into broadcasting. I'd done a lot of sports broadcasting and news broadcasting at mm -hmm. Berkeley, among other places. Uh, cable television was in its infancy, so I was involved in that uh, very early on, uh, back when about three homes had cable in the city of Oakland. Cable was one of the few industries that started in the rural area and came to the urban area because broadcast TV was free and over the air, and you could easily pick up all the available channels if you lived close to 
to mm -hmm. the towers. If you lived out in the rural areas, further away from the towers, it was difficult. So cable really was uh, began as a vehicle to bring broadcast television to farms oh. and small towns in, uh, 50 to 75 miles away from the main city. Yeah. That was way before the HBOs and Showtime <laughs> evolved into providing content. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but as far as what you referenced, uh, uh, this is way well into my career. I had a, a client that had uh, acquired uh, Snapple, the, uh, primarily iced tea brand at the time, yeah. uh, from a major company that had spent $1.4 billion on its purchase. It was a family-run company out of New York that was purchased by a Quaker who had uh, wow. a, who had bought Gatorade and done an outstanding job making Gator, Gatorade a mainstream product, taking it out of just uh, the athletic world where it was a, a drink basically to get your electrolytes up. Uh, to where it was really a mainstream, everyday, drinkable product. They did a great job with that and thought they could do that with Snapple. But Snapple had a very niche, loyal audience. And to homogenize Snapple and try to make it mainstream uh, was one for the marketing textbooks. It just didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I had a, uh, a, so a company uh, acquired the brand at a, at a great discount. And based on the experience that my agency had growing smaller brands and making them profitable, uh, they came to us and asked us to, to help try to turn the brand around. And uh, we were able to do that. And then it was acquired locally here by Dr. Pepper 7-Up. And uh, they have had the brand ever since. But what they didn't learn uh, just in a broad stroke is that people liked the, uh, there was an association with New York City uh, with Snapple. Mm -hmm. You had Winnie the Snapple, Winnie, you had Jerry Seinfeld drank it, Howard Stern drank it, Rush Limbaugh drank it. I mean, it wasn't, it was apolitical, it was a little irreverent. People associated it with New York. And when you try to, when a Chicago company acquires it and then tries to homogenize it, uh, sometimes backfires, and in this case it did, coupled with the fact that there was a tremendous uh, influx of entries into the category. Mm -hmm. You'll remember Arizona Iced Tea, and yeah. Sobe, uh, and Nantucket no uh, Nectars. And immense competition. Came into the marketplace, and this is primarily a brand that's sold at convenience stores. It's a C-store brand. Mm -hmm. If you can get those, uh, that's where your construction workers and uh, gardeners and people that are in a convenience store two or three times a day mm -hmm. uh, that's where you want them to pick up in this case a snapple two or three times a day you know morning afternoon and evening yeah and uh although there were a lot more six packs sold in the evening but <laughs> the day, you, know, uh, you know so uh the competition was fierce and they were starting to lose that and we brought mm -hmm. some we were able to bring uh reverence irreverence back into the brand and make it relevant uh, with a simple under the crown game where uh, when you would uh, twist off the cap you won nothing instantly it was called yeah. it was called win nothing instantly and consumers I played were, that game well, I did now I know consumers I know. are are accustomed to winning nothing uh, whenever they uh, play in these sweepstakes <laughs> and retailers didn't want to do anything so when you have the game under the crown they don't have to do anything mm -hmm. uh, but as long as the shelves are stocked they don't have to put anything out or redeem any entries and you did have a chance to win nothing you could win no car payments or no house payments or no anchovies on your pizza there were varying <laughs> degrees of <laughs> prizes but for the most part you won nothing and uh, people loved it because it, it was the tongue-in-cheek thing that Snapple needed to bring back the reverence and, uh, and to get it back on the retail shelves, get it back in the convenience stores, and uh, uh, their sales turned around. So 
that's wow. just one of the examples of that. Awesome. I did that, but I never took a marketing course in my life. Um, yet I was president of a, an agency here in, in Dallas, mm. and I, uh, I just turned 25, and I got two job offers in the same day, which is, uh, when does that ever happen? Hasn't happened since. And uh, one was to be editor of a, uh, of a small newspaper in uh, Carmel, Monterey, and one was to move to Dallas, be at a big agency. The furthest east I'd been was Phoenix. And so to uh, 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 just hitting 25 and hitting that point in your life where you're saying, what am I gonna do with my life? And uh, not being involved in a, you know, in a relationship that was gonna keep me there. Uh, I, uh, moving to Dallas felt right. Uh, the salaries were exactly the same. So I knew it would be a lot uh, cheaper to live in Dallas at the time. We're talking about 1984 versus uh, living in Monterey Carmel. Uh, that was a great year, by the way. 1984 was a great year. Uh, I'd agree. Well, it depends upon if you read the book. But, uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> well, it's the year it, I was it, born. It, it so was we're going to go with the idea Somehow that it was great. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to public school. It's hard to do the math. And since I was 25 in 84, I guess that makes me 25 years older than you are. But uh, what a wealth of knowledge I've been able to. You missed yes. the 70s. You missed the great... Great music era. You missed that. We heard long, about it. The long hair and <laughs> bell bottoms and uh, striped shirts and check pants. And yeah. Puka shells. So. Those might come hey. back around. I mean, yeah, trends, everything comes back. The fanny pack is back. back. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't think we got that originally on tape. So, uh, that, you were, that you're a, a fanny pack guy. But, uh, <laughs> anyway. So you, so you moved to Dallas. You're 25. Something that you brought up was that uh, <laughs> while you wanted people to go into those convenience stores and buy Snapple and three times a day, although six packs were sold more so in the evenings, talk a little bit about that because we saw that you had played a major role with the marketing of Rolling Rock. Mm -hmm. So you know you know a little or a whole lot about branding and marketing and the beer industry. So I do. Um, that's quite fascinating. We'd love to know more about what your role was there and what that looked like. Well, you know, it's, it's funny that, uh, uh, that living clean is, uh, is the motto or, or the, the mission statement of this podcast because at one point I was selling beer, casinos, uh, soft drinks and fast food, so it's not really a <laughs> clean lifestyle. But uh, the beer industry was fascinating back then. Uh, I had moved down here to work on a, a, a major Canadian brand, but small in the U.S., called Labatt Blue. And uh, basically in Canada, there were two beers. There was Molson and there was Labatt. And they literally each had 50% marketplace mm -hmm. up there mm -hmm. and they fought it out to be number one and number one was uh, a maybe a single percentage point difference uh, it was uh, so when they brought me down to to work on it and again it was basically because I could write I knew someone at the agency the only person I knew in, in Dallas and uh, uh, I did well on the interviews and I offered something a little different. The particular position that they were looking for, uh, they wanted not traditional public relations background, but a media background, people that, that understood how to work with the media. And one of my last jobs in Oakland was I worked at a daily newspaper. I worked in the sports mm -hmm. department at the Oakland Tribune. And it was, it was just like you would, you see in the movies. Um, the movies that were made before you were born. <laughs> uh, the, you know, smoke-filled uh, old guys with the, with the short sleeve shirts and ties and walking around, you know, uh, uh, grumpy, you know, trying to hit a deadline. Computers were basically non-existent. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we were still on type Typewriters, writers. yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, in fact, when I first moved here in 84, we had one computer on our floor. Mm. Uh, so uh, 
we were still writing out memos on yellow pads and handing them to the secretary. So then editing and all that wasn't as easy too then? Not at all, no, no, there was a lot of scratching out. That's how liquid paper got invented, so. Mm. Um, but, uh, so, because of its proximity to the Canadian border, Labatt had a very big uh, sales base along the U.S. border. Did well in Seattle, Detroit, Buffalo, uh, and all of upstate New York areas that were close to, to Canada, and uh, which allowed me to travel. And the greatest thing that I got out of my advertising career, probably, uh, except for a ton of great stories is I got to all 50 states mm -hmm. and nice. most, most of it on uh, my clients nickel so that's good because I was going to a lot of meetings meeting with the uh, sales distributors and retailers and so it was a great experience mm -hmm. well uh, I had left the small uh, or the large agency to join a small agency where uh, I was able to become a partner and uh, ultimately become sole proprietor and uh, that was through growing a lot of existing accounts and as Labatt's US operation grew so did we and so they started acquiring different brands around the country and one of which was uh, Rolling Rock now here was the small brewery from Latrobe Pennsylvania and people around America were familiar with uh, Latrobe because of Arnold Palmer mm -hmm. and uh, Pennzoil and the banana split was uh, created there and Whoa. and there was a uh, uh, big battle that professional football started in Latrobe and a bunch of towns in Ohio tried to tried to claim that uh, but the point is basically it was just a small town in uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, about 60, 60 miles from Pittsburgh, and in western New York, or western Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania is a very interesting state. Uh, when you're on the west side, it's very different than Philadelphia and the east side. And then you've got the middle, which, which is Rust Belt and Amish, and there you are know, all kinds of stuff going on. So it's a very interesting state. In fact, uh, Rolling Rock wasn't even the, the biggest selling beer in Pittsburgh. It was the biggest market for Rolling Rock was Philadelphia. Iron City beer was the number one beer in Pittsburgh. But at the time, uh, imagine this, uh, there were virtually no, uh, what we would now say craft beers. Uh, there was uh, Sam Adams and Anchor Steam in San Francisco. Uh, Agrostein had been around for decades. Sam Adams was just kind of a startup. And that was about it. So just like big commercial breweries, like not the small niche type of... There was, there was your Anheuser-Busch that had Budweiser and, and Bush beer. There was Miller Brewing that had Miller High Life and Miller Light. And Coors that you know, was only sold in the West for huh. years and then never never sold out east eventually was you remember smoking in the bandit that was about mm -hmm. you know smuggling coors beer i remember being on airplane seeing people put cases of coors in the overhead <laughs> to bring back to wherever they were going and um, that was about it as far as imported beers go which labat qualified uh five percent of the u.s beer market were made up of imports, 5%. Mm -hmm. That means Heineken, Corona, Bass, Guinness, Dos Equis, Tecati, uh, all of those brands together, St. Pauli Girl was big, Bex, all those brands together made up just 5% oh. of the entire US beer category. Old Milwaukee as a brand sold more beer nationally than all of those brands wow. that, that we're so familiar with. Okay, but things were changing because there was a, there was a uh, and I was in the middle of it. I mean, there was a more disposable income. Uh, young people were uh, getting out a lot. There was uh, uh, there was no AIDS epidemic. There was none of that. There was a lot of uh, the '70s were winding down into the 
uh, kind of the go-go 80s, as I like to call. There were some, uh, you know, financial hiccups uh, in the 80s, but mainly, you know, it was a Reagan time. He was trying to be, you know, very uh, bullish on America. And uh, the nightclubs were full. Uh, people were spending uh, a lot of money on, on, uh, on better things. And the playback that we kept getting was Welling Rock was this uh, cheap beer that I drank in college. And uh, the beauty of that was, uh, well, these kids are now adults, and, and they may be about to begin a family, but they may still be out there having fun. They have a lot more money than they had in college, yeah. <laughs> but they sure remember the good times. So let's try to remind mm. them with uh, Rolling Rock. We did not, uh, we took it uh, up in price, the, the brand team uh, did we made it? Uh, we gave, again gave it a reverence. What is this little brand out of Western Pennsylvania doing? And we made uh, some great inroads and tripled sales over a five-year period. Uh, we were true to the roots of the brand, which was the green long neck bottle with the painted mm -hmm. label, which mm -hmm. looked different than any other beer out there. All the other beers were brown bottle, paper labels. Light beers were were big, uh, which was equated with no flavor. You know, and here was a, you know, a, a light tasting beer, but you know, had a little bit of flavor, but a lot of charm, and so we were able to, mm -hmm. uh, to really do that, which which allowed us then to get hired to work on Snapple because of the same sort of niche oh, qualities okay. of that brand, and uh, uh, also Whataburger, which we were able to do here, do uh, uh, their uh, advertising, uh, because uh, that again is a niche brand. Uh, and we worked on uh, uh, Hollywood Casino, which was in Tunica, Mississippi, the poorest county in America at the time, whose last resort was to go to uh, Las Vegas style, which you'd be familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, gaming to try to bolster the revenues and employ people and all that. So they built 11 of these Vegas style casinos on the cotton fields of Mississippi just south of Memphis about 30 miles and you know you're driving down Mississippi and then all of a sudden you see these huge things uh, reaching for the sky they had to be on the river that was part of the caveat right, yeah. so they were river boats but river they never boats. moved yeah. they were just <laughs> you know they were on there and uh, when Hollywood when we won that account I think they were ninth in the marketplace eight, eight, eight or ninth in the market out of 11 and we basically promised them, we can't get you to one and two, but we can work real hard to get you to three. Yeah. And that's not a bad place to be. And uh, that's what we did. But again, we, we, did, we did advertising and uh, I didn't reap any of these benefits. So, you know, it's still cool though. Somebody. I mean, well, that's really no, cool. The knowledge but behind no, doing it and the experience, no, it, yeah, it, it for is, sure. It was fun. It was a, all of these were very rewarding experiences. Uh, financially rewarding for others that <laughs> sold their brands, but uh, uh, it was it was great experience, great to work on. on and uh, the best thing was uh, it was great to meet all of the variety of people around the country, mm -hmm. and you find out that you're not all that much different, no matter where you're from. Uh, and that's uh, that's an important thing uh, I think to remember uh, with. Uh, quick story on the Whataburger, they, a lot of agencies wanted that account. We were the only ones that, as an agency, that went out and actually talked to their employees. And we created a, a program uh, called What a Summer. There was a simple bundling program where, uh, bundling meaning for one price, you can get the burger, the soda, and the side, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in uh, for what a summer, being that Texas was their, their base, we featured the jalapeno burger in August, the hottest month of the year, and worked with Coke to, pr to produce a, uh, a special cup called the Extinguisher. But, you know, a little tongue-in-cheek to, to sell jalapeno.